I'm Alex. And I'm Zara. And today you're watching the history of mental illnesses throughout history. Mental illness has been around since, well, since it's been around. Which is since humans first developed functioning brains. However, the treatment of mental illness dates only as far back as 5000 BCE with evidence of trephined, trephined, trephined skulls which is basically just drilling a hole in someone's head. Now we're sliding into ancient cultures like Persia. In Persia, they believed that mental illness was caused by demons possessing the minds of the mentally ill. This is when they used uh, drilling holes into people's heads because they thought it would release the demons. They're all dead now. Now we move into ancient Egypt where their treatment of the mentally ill was a bit more advanced. And by advanced, we just mean they didn't drill holes into people's heads, at least not as often as the Persians and Indians. However, they did develop the concept of psychotherapy. That is true. But other than that, they weren't all that great. They believed that the mind and body were one, and they couldn't differentiate diseases in the mind from diseases in the body. For example, a person who was suffering from a mental illness like schizophrenia or depression could be seen would be seen the same and treated the same as someone who was born without a limb. <laughs> now in ancient India, they sucked. Real bad. In comparison to the Persians, they saw mental afflictions as being caused by demons possessing someone's mind and body. And so their main method of treatment was basically just to force the said demon out. They were also treated by priests, doctors, or politicians. It didn't matter who you were, they could be treated by anyone. A perfect example of this is an Indian woman who suffered from a mental illness. Her priest thought that the only way to get rid of this mental illness was to whip her with the tail of a stingray. Did that work? No, it killed her. And that concludes <laughs> the treatment of mental illnesses in ancient cultures. Now we're moving on into the classic whole period, specifically the Greeks. The Greeks changed the way that psychological disorders were viewed. This change in view can be credited to the Greek philosopher and physician, Hippocrates. He discovered that mental illnesses did not come from supernatural causes, but actually just natural occurrences in the body. They used techniques like phlebotomies, bloodletting, purging, and imposing diets on the afflicted. Hippocrates actually advocated um, changing the occupation and or environment of the patient. Despite the advancements, many cultures still failed to get with the advancements and they still believe in supernatural causes. An example of this would be in China, where the mentally ill were seen as a source of shame for their families. So as a result, they were simply locked away, hidden from society, or thrown out onto the streets. In more dangerous cases, they were put into dungeons or jails. This was the start of institutionalization of the mentally ill, like Western state. In the early 15th century, it was becoming more common for me the mentally ill to be housed in madhouses, workhouses, and asylums. However, these institutions were incredibly inhumane. Private madhouses were often run by clergymen and were significantly more humane, at least at first. Because they were paid to detain their patients, it became more of a business. They put the quantity of the patients over the quality of the treatment that they provide. Those admitted to both private and regular madhouses were abused, abandoned, treated like animals, restrained with shackles and iron collars, cared for by untrained staff, and even put on display. An infamous example of the horrors of early asylums would be La Bicetre. In this French asylum, patients were shackled to the walls and forced to sit in their own waste. Another example would be St. Mary of Bethlehem, an asylum nicknamed Bedlam due to its horrific treatment of the mentally ill. They put their more violent patients out on the streets and displayed them as sideshow freaks for the public to see. Their more gentler patients were forced to beg to get money for the institution. Treatments in these asylums included bloodletting, purging, blistering, dousing the patients in either boiling hot or freezing cold water to shock them, sedatives, and using physical restraints such as straitjackets. 
This all changed though when the Madhouses Act of 1774 was passed. Knowledge of the horrible treatment of the mentally ill quickly spread to the public and reforms began to take place in the mid to late 1800s. Two reformists, Felipe Pinel and William Tuke, greatly influ influenced the humanitarian movement. Pinel believed that with kindness and consideration, the mentally ill would get better and their conditions would improve. He implemented his ideas when he took over La Bicetre, the mental asylum, the French one. Tuke founded the York Retreat where patients were treated with kindness and compassion. After Pinel and Tuke, another reformist, Dorothy Dix, advocated the hospital movement. The hospital movement got the U.S. government to build 32 state psychiatric hospitals. Along with the creation of new psychiatric hospitals, acts and organizations were formed to better the lives of the mentally ill. The Mental Health America Organization and the U.S. Community Mental Health Centers Act was also formed. In Great Britain, Parliament passed the Madhouses Act of 1774, which basically regulated madhouses. The act required that all madhouses be licensed under the Royal College of Physicians. Any mentally ill person that was contained without a license was subject to a fine of 500 euros. However, in 1828, that act was repealed because it was pretty ineffective. That same year, the 1828 Madhouses Act was passed, and it was hopefully a little bit more, but it still wasn't that great because four years later, the 1832 Madhouse Act was passed, and that act basically combined the principles of the 1828 Madhouse Act with the principles of the 1829 Madhouse Law Amendment Act, and it basically just more effectively executed their purposes. As institutionalization and more humane treatments of the mentally ill became more popular, the mental aspect also gained attention. Doctors began developing new techniques to treat the mentally ill and hopefully it would cure them. One of these doctors was Sigmund Freud, an Austrian neurologist and the founder of psychoanalysis, which was a clinical method used for treating mental disorders through dialogue between a patient and a psychologist. Freud had several theories, one of which included that dreams are instigated by the daily occurrences and thoughts of everyday life, and by interpreting dreams, it provides important insight into the patient's background and symptoms. Another theory of his, we didn't include them all, but some of them are kind of boring and a little inappropriate. But the he oh, Freud developed the iceberg model. And what's the iceberg model? It was basically splitting the psych into three different parts. The first part was the ID, the second part was the super ego, and the last part was the rational ego. The ID was the impulsive part of your of your psych and that's basically the childish part if you're mad at your friend you just you punch them you, punch, punch, punch. you punch them because you're mad at them and you just want to give them a smack now the the super ego is the more like moral part you want to do what's right because it's right and you should do what's right so you're mad at your friend and you don't punch them because that's that's not right you have to do what's morally right. Be the good guy. And now the last part is called the rational ego. And that's basically a balance between the ID and the super ego. Because you can't be all impulsive and you can't be like all morally right. Because, I don't know, that's just for his theory. And so this balance of your ID and your super ego is what is shown in how you act and how you interact with other people. And that's, that's the iceberg model slash theory. And his, a third of his theories, his third one, was he encouraged the use of cocaine. Why? Cocaine is bad for you. People know that. But back then, I guess it was pretty fresh on the market because Freud was like, everybody use cocaine. You use cocaine and you use cocaine. Why? Because it'll cure you of your mental illness. It'll cure you of your, your morphine addiction. It'll get rid of all that stuff. At what cost? A little bit of moolah. Because cocaine is good for you. So he was a strong advocate for cocaine. And he actually, he like really told his friend to do it. But what happened to his friend? His friend died. 
what happened to people that use cocaine a lot? They started to die. And the public was like, wait a second, they're dying. And this Freud guy, this, this respected psychi, I'm just kidding, neurologist, was like, use it, use it, use it. But now people are dying. So this actually damaged Freud's reputation as a medical professional and a neurologist and all that stuff. But yeah, yeah, it, it was not good for Freud in the end, his advocation of cocaine use. But he actually continued to use cocaine himself to treat numerous issues he had, like depression and um, migraine and nasal inflammation. Um, yeah, that was, that was cocaine for you. That's cocaine. Interesting fact, Freud was born to Jewish parents and in 1938, Freud fled from Austria to escape the Nazis. The next year, at age 83, he died in exile in the United Kingdom. Well, historical context for you, but just because Freud's parents were Jews, does that mean he was a Jew? Maybe, I, I didn't look that up, but like nowadays, if your parents are Christians, that doesn't mean that you're a Christian. You can choose to be whatever you want. You could be a Jew or something else, whatever you wanted. But back then, there was this thing that the Nazis um, passed called the Nuremberg Laws, and that it ba they basically stated like, Jews can't do this and they can't do that. They can't marry German people. They can't do a number of things. They can go into our camps and die in the gas chambers. They can, they can work for us. We can take control of them. But what the thing was, was they used the word Jew in this, but they had no definition of what a Jew was. So what is a Jew? And this is where the Michelin test came in. And the Michelin test basically said, if you had one grandparent that was a Jew, you were a Jew. So all of a sudden people who had like one grandparent that were, was a Jew, they now all became Jews. So it was like, you're a Jew, you're a Jew, and you're a Jew, we're all Jews. They might not have actually been Jews, but they were a Jews in the Nazis' eyes, and what happened, happened to them? The Nazis went after them, and that's what happened to Freud. And that's Freud, why he fled. Freud fled, because he was thought to be a Jew. He might have been, we don't know. And Freud's legacy. While psychoanalysis is in an overall decline, it still influences many fields like psychology, psychiatry, and psychotherapy. Mental illness has been prominent throughout history, and it still is today. So here are some people you may know who suffer from various mental illnesses. First, Britney Spears. She struggles with depression and bipolar disorder. She has had several public mental breakdowns. Albert Einstein's son, Edward Einstein. Edward Einstein suffered from schizophrenia. Although it wasn't caught at a young age, like most schizophrenics don't get it at a young age, but he was actually on the, <laughs> the path to become a medical professional when he had to stop because he was suffering from schizophrenia. He was then moved to the psychiatric hospital, Bergerzy in Zurich, Switzerland. Vincent Van Gogh. Although never diagnosed, many historians believe that Vincent Van Gogh suffered from schizophrenia. John Hinckley Jr. This was Ronald Reagan's attempted assassin because he did not kill him, but he was known to suffer from schizophrenia. And Demi Lovato. She struggled with bulimia and anorexia. She now has come public with her struggles and is an advocate for anti-bulimia. <laughs> Effects of mental illness on society today. Mental disorders cost society at least $193.2 billion annually in lost earnings alone. Indirect costs of mental illness. So lost earning potential, which just means that the mentally ill either can't work as often or just not at all. And then costs associated with treating coexisting conditions, and social security payments, homelessness, and incarceration. Some direct costs of mental illness are a lot easier to track down. And these are like hospital bills, medical bills, the actual medications, just yeah, stuff like that. Stuff like that. Stuff that you can actually track down on pa paper. Um, in a recent study, researchers polled a portion of the population. This is what they found out. 86% of respondents reported earning income in the previous year. Those with SMI, serious mental illnesses, reported earning 22,000 
in some change. Compared to respondents without serious mental illnesses, that earned about $38,000. This is a $16,000 difference. So you can imagine that for every person, $16,000 difference, that adds up really quickly. And then the WHO, which is the World Health Organization, recommends developed nations adopt more comprehensive preventative and interventional mental health programs. So in the future, the mental mental health is not doesn't have as much of a stigma attached to it, and uh, countries, developed countries and developing countries, can just better support the population that is struggling with them. Just treat them better. I'm Zara, and I'm Alex. And you're watching Animal Planet! Unbelievable, the cubs are actually going to deal with an adult. For the first time ever in their lives, the three cubs have just brought down an adult female gazelle. It has to be said that Honey did help in that she started the hunt and rather gruesomely gazelle broke a leg almost immediately it tried to run but this is precisely the sort of lesson that these cubs need <laughs>